Good morning. Good to be here with you all this morning, and thank you all, worship team, and glad to have Josh with us. I enjoyed meeting with him earlier this week, and, and enjoying to start, starting to work together with him, and just uh, being able to bounce ideas off of each other and pray together, and pray for you all, and, and pray for Sunday, and, and so I'm excited about what God is, um, is doing here at Safe Harbor, and, and thank you all for leading us in a time of worship and, and bringing us into the presence of God through singing. And so, uh, first of all, let me wish you all a happy new year. Hope uh, everybody um, had a good good break and uh, was able to enjoy a day off or whatever from work. Um, hard to believe it's 2016 and during the new year I saw there's a chance of snow coming up in a day or two. So it's that time of year. But uh, I, I have a hard time uh, staying up at night so I did not ring in the new year properly. <laughs> but uh, anyways, I wanted to wish you all a happy new year. Uh, I wanted to uh, to mention we're going to pray for Ironworks Pike Community Church this morning, um, and I want to uh, to pray that the Lord would, would bless that congregation. Um, and uh, Jack Brooks, who's the pastor there, I've had the opportunity to, to meet with him and appreciate his heart for Georgetown and his heart for the Lord. And so let's uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Father, we do thank you for uh, this time to, to come together at the beginning of this new year and uh, to celebrate and worship you. Just as we ended the last year in worship, we want to bring in this new year in worship, an acknowledgement of who you are, God, and acknowledgement that we owe our very lives to you. And we want to, to give you all the glory in our lives. We want to live for you. Lord, I'm, I'm thankful for being able to, to sing uh, and, and reflect our hearts and our minds and our joys in you through song. And what an uplifting thing that is to be able to do to our spirits, to our souls, to sing to you. Father, we want to pray for Ironworks Pike Community Church this morning. Uh, Lord, that you would bless Brother Jack there and, and for that congregation. I know they're faithful to preach your word. And they desire to see many come to know you. And so I pray, Lord, that you would use them. May they be faithful servants of you and bless the work that they are doing. Fathers, we begin to, to look at your word together this morning. Lord, we ask that you would open up our hearts and our, our eyes to see you and to see your truth. May you speak to us today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, uh, as, we, as I mentioned, you know, with the new year, uh, with the new year comes this idea of newness often. Uh, we, we often hear of the, the new opportunities ahead of us, and we think about some of those things ahead of us this coming year. And we think about the New Year's resolutions. How many of us made resolutions this week? How many of us actually think we'll keep the resolutions <laughs> this year? Uh, I know I, had some, I have some goals. I, I won't necessarily call them resolutions, but I have some goals in my life that I want to work towards. And I think the New Year provides an opportunity to kind of just sit and reflect on where you are and where you want to be. Uh, spiritually, physically, um, in different ways. Um, and the Bible, it's interesting that the Bible resonates with this idea of newness. And in fact, God's desire is for all people to be made new. To be made new in Christ. That's what the Christian life is all about. A, a new life. And there's probably no better book that I can find, or in my mind, than the book of Ephesians that talks about newness in Christ and who God wants us to be. So today we're going to start a new sermon series in the book of Ephesians, and we're going to call it the Identity and Life in Christ. Identity and Life in Christ, um, which is really the theme of this book. Um, we're going to work our way through this letter that Paul wrote to this church, and uh, we're not going to cover every single verse, but we're going to hit the big ideas over the next few months, and let me encourage you in the meantime to kind of read between the lines. Maybe if we skipped over a few verses, read those on your own so you can kind of keep up with, with where we're going and where we are in the book each week. But the book of Ephesians really examines um, up and down what the Christian life is about and how Christ changes us and makes us new. So the first half of the book, the uh, first three chapters or so, kind of talk about our identity in Christ who we are as Christians. And what we're going to find is who we are, and understanding that rightly 
then shapes how we live, which is what Paul focuses on in the second half of the book. We need to understand who we are in, as Christians, <coughs> who God uh, makes us, in order to know how we need to live. Um, and, and so that's what we're going to focus on over these next few months. And so for us today, I would venture to say that there's kind of three types of people uh, as we think about the book of Ephesians and, and coming up and approaching this book and becoming made new, there's kind of three types of people out there, to, out, out here today, uh, among you all. First type of person is somebody who knows that they need something new in their life. Uh, things aren't just working out the way they are right now. There's, there's baggage, there's old things pulling us down. We need a new change in our life. That's where some of you all are today. For others, there's some of us who have maybe just experienced Christ and just come to know who He is and found a new life in Christ, but you're not really sure what that new life looks like. You're not really sure yet who you really are in God's eyes. You're not really sure what you're supposed to do differently. And there's some of us here today as well. And then there's another group of us who have been a Christian probably for quite some time, and you need to be reminded of who you are in Christ. We have a tendency as people to forget. Uh, if we're not reminded from, from time to time, we, we lose our sense of identity and who we are. And so we need to be reminded and compare our life right now with where we are with God versus where we want to be or where we should be or where God wants us to be. And so we have to keep in mind the gospel and understanding the gospel is not a one-time thing. It's an ongoing thing where we continue to grow. Amen. We continue to become more like Christ. And so God wants uh, to remind us of who we are and where we came from in, in order to move us forward. And so today we're going to start off at the beginning of the book of Ephesians uh, by looking at the work of the Father in our life and how that shapes our identity, how that gives us a, a, a clear view of who we are before God as Christians. And we're going to look at, in these uh, three or four verses at the ideas of being chosen and adopted in Him. And I want us just to kind of take this in and reflect on it as we read through it together. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians 1. We're going to read verses 3 through 6 together. If you don't have your Bibles, you can follow along on the, the screens here with me. All right, starting in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted through Jesus Christ for himself according to his favor and will to the praise of his glorious grace that he favored us within the beloved. Alright, so this passage uh, is an interesting passage. It's, it's a passage that a lot of people get tripped up on um, because it talks about God choosing and predestining us. And these are some, some words that have caused a lot of conflict in churches. And unfortunately, uh, those conflicts have caused people to miss the bigger truth of what God is doing here. But I want us to be clear. We can't ignore the words of the Bible. Where, as Christians, as Southern Baptists, we believe that every word of God's word is true. And so what do we do with these words? What do we do with these words? Well, first of all, we have to recognize that the Bible has something to teach us, something to say to us. And uh, in spite of maybe some bad experiences we've had with passages like this or similar to it, uh, this is God's Word. And uh, it's teaching us something positive about who God is. It's important for us to realize who God is and who we are as a result of what this truth communicates. So one thing I love about working through books of the Bible is you can't ignore the hard passages. You know, if you just pick and choose, you can just skip around the, uh, the tricky ones, the ones that nobody really wants to talk about. You know, the, the, this type of passage or talking about money or, or some other thing that, that nobody really wants to, to bring up. And so let's look at this together. Let's explore this together and see what God wants to teach us. And I want us to get past the wording and the, the past stigmas that we've associated with the idea of God choosing and, and predestining. And I want us to, to recognize the big picture. And the truth is that uh, we have to acknowledge all of us that there is a mystery about salvation. There is a mystery. 
about salvation. Um, God, in many verses, it talks about God being a sovereign God who rules, who reigns, who accomplishes his plans and his purposes. But at the same time, we see other verses that talk about us freely needing to choose him. And it's our responsibility as well. So God rules and God reigns, and we are responsible. We have to work. And both these truths, they seem incompatible to each other. They seem like they, they can't agree. They can't both function. But they do. They're both in the Bible. And so the Bible teaches both, and we have to just acknowledge this is a mystery, how all this plans out. Charles Spurgeon, the, the great uh, English preacher from the 18, 1800s, was once asked if he could reconcile divine sovereignty and human responsibility to each other. He was asked, how do you do that? And he said, I wouldn't try. I never reconcile friends. We're already reconciled. And so we, we have this tendency to see uh, God's sovereignty and our responsibility as playing against each other. And like they're not compatible, and so they fight against each other. When in reality, they're friends. God wants us to recognize they're both true, and they both help us in our Christian life, in our Christian walk. They're not enemies. They work together. And even though they apparently contradict each other, they are both true. God is in control of accomplishing his purposes, and man is responsible for what he has called us to do and for our own actions. Uh, Deuteronomy 29, 29 kind of summarizes this, this apparent contradiction. It says, The hidden things belong to the Lord our God, but the revealed things belong to us and our children forever, so that we may follow all the words of the law. This is a hidden thing that only God can fully understand. But what we do have to recognize is that he has revealed certain things to us. And he calls us to follow him in what we do know. He calls us to live obediently before him. Our response, uh, J.R. Packer, has a great little book, and I'm just going to advertise it a little bit here. Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God. If you like reading, this is a helpful book which uh, helps us balance the, tr the truths of what we are called to do and who God is and what God is doing. And it gives a good perspective, and especially with the idea of evangelism and sharing the gospel with people. Um, so I would recommend that. But he says in this book that we have to recognize that we didn't invent how this world works, and we cannot explain it. We need to accept it for what it is and live with the understanding that both things are true, and they're complementary to each other. And so we don't have to know. I want, to, I want us to understand. We don't have to know how everything works in this world. We don't have to know. We can't know how everything works in this world. But we can live by faith and believe the words of God. And that's what he's calling us to do. Live by faith. And so this passage that we are focusing on today, while there's many who fo that, that focus on the responsibilities of us as people and the choices we make, this passage happens to focus on who God is and his sovereignty and his work in salvation, in our lives. And so let's focus in on that. And let's just get a big picture of who our God is. And let's see how that changes us. So Paul is trying to bring, we notice right away, before he even brings up these things, what Paul is trying to do. <coughs> Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. What's he saying here? Praise God. Worship God for these things that I am about to tell you. Praise Him. He's trying to bring us to worship. He's trying to bring us to worship the God who has saved us. What a, what a, what a thing to imagine. The God who saved us. He deserves worship. In, in verses 3 through 14, it's just kind of this overflow in Paul's life of praise, of recognizing all this work that God has done. And in the original Greek, verses 3 through 14 is all one big sentence. You can imagine a, 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 a sentence that long. Just look in your Bible and see how long that is. One sentence. And what it is, is it's just Paul going and going. He's getting wound up, praising God, and recounting of what God has done. It's worship. And that's what he wants us to, to be brought to today, as we think about our God. And so this passage is an essential foundation for us to understand as Christians today who we are in Christ. Who we are. Where do we stand before God? How did we get here? 
And what it really emphasizes is the gift of salvation. The gift that God has given us. And what we all recognize, it's Christmas, you know, just after Christmas time, we just exchange gifts and things. What do gifts deserve? Thanks. Right? I remember my mom used to make me write out thank you note after thank you note after thank you note to teach that, teach that to me. Right? Gifts deserve thankfulness. And so when we recognize the gift of salvation from God to us, we recognize it deserves thankfulness on our behalf. Amen. So as we understand this, then we will worship God rightly, then we'll be changed. So let's look here at, at these, these two truths that we see in this passage. The first thing we see is that God has chosen us to be holy and blameless. God has chosen us to be holy and blameless, verse 4. After Paul leads us into this, this beginning of praise and blessing of God for all these spiritual blessings he has given to us, he begins to talk about how it came to be. How it came to be in our lives. And the first thing he says in verse 4 is, For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. This is an amazing statement when we stop and think about it. Let's, let's kind of take this, this statement apart, word by word, or phrase by phrase. First, it talks about God's eternal nature. He chose us before the foundation of the world. That means before anything was ever created, God had chosen us. Because God is eternal. He is from everlasting to everlasting. God has always existed. Wrap your minds around that. This is God. Second thing we see, God had plans from the beginning. Our God is not a God of accidents. God is a God who plans and accomplishes His purposes for His glory. It says that He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. He made the decision. He had a plan. Is, did Adam and Eve's sin surprise God? No. Does our sin surprise God? No. God is not surprised. He is God. He knows all things. Amen. He is accomplishing His plans and His good purposes. And as we see, He has a, a plan to accomplish sinful people from the beginning. And that just points to God's goodness and God's mercy and God's grace. Third thing we see is He chose us. As Christians, He chose us. Can you imagine God choosing you out of all the people, all the things He could have chosen He chose you? Think about who you are. You know, we often get flattered in our lives when we're chosen for certain things, to be, when we're picked for certain things. You know, when I was growing up, I used to love playing basketball. And so when somebody would pick me to be on their team playing basketball, then I would be excited. You know, I'd be kind of flattered. Um, hey, I got picked to play. I don't have to sit and watch everybody else play. Uh, well, and that's just basketball, right? We get excited about getting picked for a little game like that. Um, think about the fact that all the things we have done that have offended God, and yet God picks us to play in the game. Right? God picks us to be a part of his people. It's like we're the worst basketball player ever imaginable. And not only that, we've offended the guy picking us. And you, you just thing after thing, right? And he still picks us to play. That's what God has done for us. He has chosen us. Get a picture of that. Love that God. And, and so we see the fact that God has chosen us. The, second th or the fourth thing we see is he chose us with a purpose. He chose us with a purpose, and that purpose is to be holy and blameless in His sight. How many of us feel like we are holy this morning? How many of us feel like we are blameless before God this morning? I don't see any hands, and that's, that's good, because we're not. All right. If we think back on, on all the things we've done, even this morning, we recognize as Christians, when we come to faith in Christ, He sees us as holy from that point on. He doesn't see our imperfections. He sees us as blameless in His sight. Not only does He see us as blameless in His sight, He makes us more that way. He calls us to live that way. Not that we'll ever reach perfection. But we, we grow in holiness because He already sees us as holy. That, that burden is taken off our shoulders. It's not on us to make ourselves perfect. 
And when that burden is released, it becomes so much easier to live it out. We talk about grace. We talk about receiving a gift we don't deserve. It's the fact that God looks at us in a blameless way. Wow. It's mind-boggling. And he chose that to be possible for us. And then the last thing we see is all this happens in him. It says he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. He's talking about Christ here. All these things work out in our life because of the work of Jesus. Because of what he has done in coming to this world, living perfectly, dying horribly, and rising from the grave. All, all God's purposes of salvation for us and the fact that we're made holy happened because of who Christ is and what he's done. We have to recognize that and give praise and glory to him for making that possible. For sending Jesus to do such a thing as that. So for us, once we understand these truths, what do we do with them? What do, what do we understand when we take apart this passage and see all these great things that God has done? We need to wait, let the weight of this sit on us for a little while, first of all. Let it sit on us. This is who we are as Christians. This is who we are before God. He's chosen us an undeserving people to be his people. It also shows us that he is Lord over all time and history, and so that means that he is Lord over our life. A quote that I heard this, this week, and how we can apply this is, understanding this forms a bedrock of confidence for the believer. <coughs> A God who chose you before time, when only He existed, will not leave you victim to the times of this life and the trials of this life. God can be trusted. God will accomplish His purposes in our lives. He's already proven faithful. God is in control. And what a comfort to us as we live for Him. What a comfort. What a, what a confidence that God is with us. We also see that as he made us blameless and holy, as I said, it takes the weight off our shoulders so that we can now live holy lives. We're now free to live for God. We're not weighed down by our sin, always feeling guilty for all the ways that we fall short and fail. We know that God looks at us differently. And when somebody looks at us differently, it changes how we view ourselves, doesn't it? When we, when we see that somebody accept us, accepts us for who we are and doesn't judge us, it changes how we live. We're not always trying to meet their approval. We're not always trying to work our way to, to, to please them. We already know they, they are pleased with us. So let's live freely and openly for God and not feel like we're burdened to do so. And, and we see how God makes that possible here in this passage because he chose us to be holy and blameless in his sight. So the first thing we see is that in, in, in verses 4. In verse 4. Then we see another thing that Paul mentions in verse 5. And that is, we're predestined to be adopted through Jesus Christ for himself. Uh, so we continue that, this thought of, of praise and worship of God and recognizing what he's done in our life. Again, don't get hung up on the word predestined here. We recognize that, that God has worked out our salvation. and He sees us through, as a result, as adopted children. We are children of God. We are his own family. To the original audience, this was written in the time of the Roman Empire. And so, uh, as we think about Paul writing to this, this colony in the Roman Empire, he was, he was thinking with the legal implications of adoption in his mind. And what it meant for a Roman child to be adopted legally meant that first they would gain all the rights of a natural child in the family. They would have all the same rights. Second, they would be released from control of their previous family or their previous circumstance. They had uh, no longer weighed down by that in their past. Third thing, they received a new name. A name is often identified with their identity. Right? They received a new name. Uh, fourth, they, they share now in the status of their new family. So if it's a wealthy family, they get to share in that wealth. If it's a politically... Um, prominent family, they get to share in that prominence. So adoption in the Roman Empire meant a huge change for that person. It completely changed their life. 
And adoption into God's family means the same for us. It means a huge change for us as people. We are now privy to all the rights of a child of God. And who is the child of God? Jesus, the perfect Son of God. We now have all the same rights as Jesus. Think about all He's done and all we haven't done, and we still have all the same rights as Him. That is how God views us. That has, is what, means, what it means for God to adopt us into His family. He sees us as He sees His only Son who died for us. Wow. The idea of adoption you know, has come to mean even more to, to me and my family and my wife uh, as we've adopted a child into our family. And uh, I can tell you from experience, you know, I see her as the same as I see my other children. They're all equal in my eyes. There's no distinction. I want the same things for all of them. I, I, I see them equally. I, I treat them equally. They are all family. And so... Uh, this idea of option, that, uh, adoption, that is how God sees us. We are all sons and daughters before him. He treats us all equally, even though we don't deserve it. He treats us as he treats his own son, Jesus. Um, and so as we think about this idea of adoption, and being adopted into God's family, it changes <coughs> our relationships. First of all, it changes our relationship with God. How does it, how does it do that? If you're a Christian today, do you recognize, first of all, that you are a child of God? Amen. He, he has made that possible. He has made that happen. And not, not just in name only. <coughs> you now have access to all the rights of a child of God. All the privileges that come with that. God is your father. Now, there's a recent song that's been on the radio, if you listen to K-Love or songs of Christian radio, called Good, Good Father by Chris Tomlin. I really love that song. And what I want to do is just read off. He really reflects in that song about who God the Father is and what that means for him and for us as Christians. So I want to read some of the phrases that he mentions in the song and because it really applies to who we are as adopted children in God's family. First thing he says is, uh, you tell me that you're pleased and that, and that I'm never alone. When God adopts us into his family, he's pleased with us as his children. Pleased with us. Always. Again, that goes back to seeing us as holy and blameless. And that we're never alone. He is a God who is always with us. He is a Father who is always with us. Some of us on this earth have had earthly fathers that have left. And that is a, a horrible consequence of the brokenness of this world. Of the fallenness and the sin of this world. But God is a Father who will never leave. He is always, 100% of the time, with us. Even those of us with good fathers and trustworthy fathers have moments where we wish our father was with us. Right? God is always with us. Another phrase he says in that song is, we're all searching for answers only you provide. God is a father who knows all things. You know, I reflect back to my days growing up and I had all these questions that my dad knew the answer to. Right? He knew how to put the fishing lure on the line. He knew how to get from here to there. That I didn't know. And as I talk about getting from here to there, I hear a GPS somewhere around here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyways, the, uh, you know, God is a God who has all the answers. He's a Father who knows what we need and provides those answers for us. That, that's God. That's what it means for Him to be our Father. Third thing we see is that I'm, He says, I'm loved by you is who I am. His identity is the fact that he's being loved by God perfectly. As a, a loving, heavenly father, he loves us perfectly. Do you realize that you're loved by God? If you don't feel loved today by anybody, God loves you if you are in Christ. He loves all people. But as Christians, we can know and understand and feel that love. Fourth thing we see is you are perfect. He says you are perfect in all your ways to us. It just kind of summarizes God is perfect in all his ways to us as a father. There's nothing wrong that he does to us. All the wrong things we do, he does nothing wrong. Perfect father. That's what it means to be a part of God's family. To have him as our father. You can talk with him. You can listen to him. He loves you unconditionally. He's personal. 
we can go to him in prayer. God's personal. He's not distant. He's not a father that lives five countries over. He's, we have very access, access to God. He's personal and close. And he's never going to leave us. And God made this possible. That's what verse 5 says. He predestined us to be adopted through Jesus for himself. God made it possible. It also changes, so it changes our view and relationship with God, but it changes our view and our relationship with others as well. As followers of Christ, as adopted children, we now have brothers and sisters in Christ. We are now part, all of us here in Christ are part of the same family. And when we remember that, it changes how we view each other, doesn't it? It changes how we interact. Families want peace with each other. They want to, to help each other and work together. There's a, a common bond that holds us. We want to love one another. We want to express that love for one another. And we understand each other at a deeper level because of where we come from. And so uh, as we think about who we are as adopted children, let's think about each other as brothers and sisters in Christ Amen. and how that identity shapes our relationships to one another. Uh, we are the family of God. Let's encourage each other. Let's help each other along the way. Let's remind each other of who our Father is. Because we need those reminders. Let's support one another. Let's care for one another. We're going to have trials in our life. We need family. We are each other's family. So as we just take a step back and reflect on this, this opening section of Ephesians, and we reflect on God's choosing and adopting of us for holiness and as his children, kind of summarizes our thought in verse 6. Paul says, To the praise of his glorious grace, that he favored us with in the beloved. God deserves praise for the grace that he has shown us as his beloved, as his people. So as we take a step back, I can't help but say, wow, God, wow, you did this for me? Wow. It changes everything. It changes our identity. It changes how we see ourselves. gives us hope for now. It gives us hope for the future. It drives us to worship Him in recognition of who He is. And it really sets the stage for the rest of Ephesians. As we understand our identity is coming from God and not from ourselves, it changes how we live. We're humbled, we are motivated by what we have received, the gift that God has given us. It humbles us. Now, one last thing for, for some of us here today. The thing I know that some of you are probably thinking and have been thinking since the beginning is, well, how do I know if God has chosen me? Aren't, are you saying I can't get in unless I'm chosen? John 1.12 says, To as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the children of God. So if while I have been up here talking to you, if you have a desire to believe in Jesus, then that desire is from God. And I urge you to act on it. We have the responsibility to act, to choose. You would not have that desire if God were not working in your heart. Paul tells us, no one seeks God. Not one. So here's how God works in our life. He, he, develop, he develops a conviction of sin in us. Where you begin to lose your, your desire for sin. The way you're living. The things you know are wrong. Then you see the beauty of Christ. And you desire Him. You recognize your need for God. Your need for Christ. Before, you, you really didn't care about God. You didn't care about Jesus. But now in your heart, you have a desire for God. Amen. If that's happening to you right now, God is drawing you. That's God working in your life. The fact that you're here today shows that God is doing something in your life. It's not an accident that you met a Christian at work who started talking to you about who Jesus was. It's not an accident that you met somebody in your neighborhood who invited you to come to church. Those things aren't accidents. Those are God at work in this world and in your life. It shows that God is seeking you. He wants you to know Him. 
And for us, it's, it's on us to just believe and follow that call. So I can say without hesitation today that the choice is entirely yours right now. God has put the ball in your court, if that's you. Jesus said, whoever will may come. He's not going to deny you if you want to come to him. Have you given your life completely to God today? Have you? Others of us, do we need to reaffirm our commitment to God as we remember what we've read today? Will we remember what he's done in our life? How he deserves our worship. How he deserves all of our life for bringing us to where we are in him. The challenge I want each of us to have today in our life is we need to follow him with everything we have in light of the truths of, of these verses. Let's pray together. Amen. Father, we are, are thankful for the mystery of how you work in this world. God, we can't understand it. We are just simple people. We are simple-minded people who can't reconcile things that seem impossible yet are true and are spoken of in your word. So, Father... Help us today to, to worship you as we recognize the work that you have done in us. And help us also to recognize our own resp responsibility to, to live for you and to follow you. To make choices that honor and glorify you. Lord, we don't understand how that works, but we want to be faithful. And we want to know you mm -hmm. rightly. Open our eyes to see your truth. Lord, if there is anybody here today that is this feeling that you're working in their life, that they need to give their life to you. Lord, I pray that they would make that decision today to give their life completely to you. Lord, if there's others among us who uh, just need to be reminded today of your choosing and adopting of us and how that completely changes who we are. Lord, may we make a, a, that commitment in our life to, to reflect on that to live more fully and freely for you. God, we just ask that you would speak to us and change us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, we're going to have a, a song.